has been one of the best of the festivals that we've had since I've been coming here. And I just, uh, I have been blessed. And as we, uh, as we look at some things, I want to summarize some things that I said before and, and emphasize some things that I think are very important. Uh, I, I do need to make the disclaimer so you can start um, putting it on now. And that is that uh, this, my opinions do not represent uh, the Northern California Conference of Seventh-day Adventists, who is my employer, nor does it represent uh, anything but my own opinion. And uh, I'm grateful to work in a conference where I am allowed to follow the dictates of my conscience. And I have been blessed in working in Northern California, and I am looking forward to going back to my church in Lakeport, California. Any of you want to come visit us, we'd love to have you come visit. And uh, with that, I want to begin. I have some slides. I don't really even know what order they're in. I do know uh, one of my church members actually made this for me. I had a sermon called Cookie Cutter Christians. And I asked uh, if she could make me a cartoon that would go with it. I thought that was pretty good, don't you? You see all the diversity of the people that are coming? They're short, they're, they got big hairdos, no hair, some hair. Uh, they're short, tall, in between. But you notice how they come out? They all look the same. They look like the person who's turning the crank. I believe in unity, brothers and sisters. And I believe when we keep our eyes on Jesus, we will all arrive at unity in the faith. And we don't need to attack each other. Satan will do that soon enough. We need to learn to know the truth. Because the truth will make us free. And so I want to address some of the things that our friend the scholar says. Uh, he maintains, for instance, that if you come to one of our camp meetings, which are joyful, they're spiritual. Uh, in fact, I think he says one of the best camp meetings that he's ever been to. So we'll just take one of the cuts where he actually says that. It'll take a second, but they'll, I, I want you to hear it in his own word. Anticipation. Anticipation. Something's not so positive. Quick example, some things you, you learn out there are, are helpful. Uh, in 1997, this is just a tangent, so I'm not going to even stand by the pulpit. This is something not to do with my message. But in 1997, I had a chance to go to Israel. On my way traveling from somewhere, 1997 was 50 years since when? I don't say 1947. <laughs> it was the year of the discovery of those famous Dead Sea Scrolls. And so I had a chance to go and be involved in an archaeological excavation on the tell, on the mound where Philip, Peter, and Andrew were from. What town? Bethsaida. And I worked with the University of Nebraska. And uh, then I went to the... Um, Big convention, 50 years since the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls. And the reason I'm telling you this, because I sat in these meetings and I listened to these archaeologists and Bible scholars. But when I listened to them, I was astounded at the skepticism. They didn't believe in inspiration. They didn't believe the Bible was, was inspired by God. It was just, you're kidding. These great scholars, they were too brilliant to believe in the Word of God. So some of these things, you go to them and you learn what Listen to not to do. <laughs> How not to become. I just thought I would share that with you. But don't go there unless you're doing it for your research, for your study, so that you can share with others. Let's go. Did you get the philosophy there? Don't go there unless you're going there to do research. And he came to Terabella. And he came and he talked with John. And he talked, uh, he talked with me. He talked with several people. It was interesting when I talked to Pam Benton, who's a very dear friend of mine, lives in uh, Lakeport, goes to my church. I told her what he had said. And we're going to hear that in the next clip. It's, it's just a short one. But it's interesting. He talks about how he would give Bible proofs one-on-one -on -one with individuals around the campground here. And they would say, yeah, you know, you have a point. I'll have to study that out. And Pam said, that never happened at our place. We are, he always said that to us. Next clip. As earnestly as I can say, folks, please be very, very careful. 
I have several wonderful feast-keeping friends, Seventh-day Adventists in different parts of this country. I have a friend of mine who calls me from Canada. He is a feast-keeper. At my mother-in-law's church, there is another feast-keeping family. Feast-keepers are arising all over in the United States. They are I wonder very why. prolific on the Internet. They write quite well. They, produce, they are producing books and DVDs. But here's the caution, and if you're a feast keeper, please listen. please listen. As I've had the opportunity to study with them, to talk with them, on various occasions, we've, we've one-on-one, person-to-person, we've studied the Bible, and as I have shared with them and said, now look at the text, what the text actually says, such as Genesis 19, talking about Lot, remember, Lot produced a a feast for the angels and I will take them and they say ah oh, look Lot had a feast which means feasts started way before Moses introduced them and I'll take them to the Hebrew and they will see it even in Strong's Mishter uh oh and my feast keeping friend will then say you've got a point okay Lot was not celebrating the feast days okay they'll say that one on one every time however when they've gone back to their group they've rejected everything we've done in a personal Bible study once they go back, they go back to their, they're part of a very close-knit, loving group. And it seems, so far, I have not been able to assist, help anyone. Every time they go back to their group and they have wonderful fellowship, I will not minimize it. As I mentioned before, one of the best camp meetings I've ever been to was a feast-keeping camp meeting because it was vibrant, lively, reverent, and spirit-filled with, with singing these wonderful, uplifting songs but with all the good by the way the devil never brings you just everything bad he has sufficient truth you know that so that he can slip in what falsehood and so there's a lot of beautiful good things happening but there's this false stream of feasts that is overwhelming and this is the focus of it and and the problem is that once somebody gets sucked into the feast keeping group it looks like they remain there they don't leave so be very careful. By the way, you can, you can get this through American Christian Ministries. I'm not necessarily doing an advertisement. But truth has nothing to fear from falsehood. And so I, I listened to this one time, and I had it going on in my living room, and my, my wife is a nurse. She was charting, and uh, she came out to the front room and said, could you turn that down, please? So I did. Uh, I turned it down, and then a few minutes later she came out. Could you turn that down further, please? I said, I can barely hear it myself. She says, it's really making me upset. Because she was hearing immediately in her spirit that there was something that there was not right. And with all of the scholarship... By the way, do you know that there are PhDs that believe that you go to heaven when you die? There are doctor of theology that believe that hell is forever burning. Do you believe that there are, do you know that there are doctor of ministry people who actually believe that the that Sunday is the Sabbath? They have all that training, but they become too brilliant to learn. I, I, it, there's a lesson for this, and I think we need to understand something. Jesus did not have one doctor of the law in the 12 disciples. Not one! Now, it's not because education's bad. I loved my time at Southwestern. I learned a lot of tools. And some of you have been a little concerned because uh, some of you don't think my cynicism is uh, such that you don't recognize it and others don't like my cynicism because you don't like cynicism. Understand, I'm trying to use it as a homiletical tool. You see, when you say something and you, and you say it in such a way that you can see the ridiculousness of it, then psychologically you distance yourself from that position. Do you understand what I'm saying? So when I put something on the screen that you know is patently wrong, it's not because I'm trying to get you to believe that. I'm trying you to see, for you to see it and say, there's something wrong with that. And so that's the reason, I, 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 and I haven't meant to be cynical or, or sarcastic, but it does bother me 
the, of the tunnel vision. In most cases, when you take an education, continuing education, and you, you uh, go to get your, you get your bachelor's degree and then your master's degree, and usually your master's degree has a master's thesis, and then you have a doctorate and you're told, you're, you're basically told, or you select and it's approved what you're going to do a doctorate on. Then you compile a thesis and you do oral, you submit a thesis and then you do an oral examination and you respond to peers, sometimes eight or nine of them, and they decide whether or not you've done enough research and it, it, it's meritorious and then they award you a doctorate. Uh, and, and with all that said, there is benefit in education, but I've discovered something about education. Education is designed to broaden your horizons. Okay? That's why you take a liberal arts major, in order to broaden your perspective so that you're exposed to all sorts of different uh, understandings and different disciplines. But I've discovered that the more specialized you become, the more narrow your vision becomes. And trust me, if you've ever talked to, talk to somebody who has their PhD in political science, there is only one way to see politics, and it's their way. Do you understand what I just told you? The more specific, the more highly trained you get in a discipline, the more narrow your view becomes instead of widening it. You become very focused. And I think that's exactly what's happened with our friend the scholar. He has become so focused on the sanctuary as being from Sinai and from Egypt to Canaan that he has abandoned the big view of from Eden lost to Eden restored. That is the thing I would say the most. Now, as far as stress the most tonight, as, we, as I'm speaking to you, don't lose uh, the, uh, the picture, uh, the big picture. Don't lose the big focus. Because if you become too narrow, then suddenly, you know, the sacrifices are inextricably linked to the, to, to, to the feast days. And so when that stops, they stop. It's very easy to extrapolate that. But Daniel says what Daniel says, remember? And he shall confirm, say it with me, he shall confirm the covenant with many for week. And in the middle of the week shall Messiah be cut off, not for himself, but for the, for the people. Okay? In the middle of the week. So you see, you need, need to understand, he shall cause, what is it? The sacrifice and oblation to cease. My brother just before me made that very clear, didn't he? So that's what ended. And by the way, there is a sacrifice to be made. Now the sacrifice is for Randy Brems to be offered on the altar so that Jesus can do anything he wants with him. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Though he terminate me, yet will I trust him. And you know, we've had a, an interesting time with tents and water and so forth. But I just wanted to look at a couple of things. Well, let's look at these first. First of all, the, the, our friend the scholar says that uh, wearing tzitzis. Now, I, I want to get so the camera can see these. These are tzitzis, okay? Now, that's the, he, he'll say that when you come to a feast-keeping camp meeting, that what they're trying to do is, is make you be more Jewish. No, it's Numbers 15, 37. Look at it. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, by the way, when God says, speak unto the children of Israel, it's like, listen up, folks. And bid them that they make them fringes in the borders of their garments throughout their generations. And that they put upon the fringe of the borders a ribbon of blue. And it shall be unto you a fringe that ye may look upon it. And you may remember all the commandments of the Lord and do them. And that ye seek not after your own heart and your own eyes after which ye use to go a whoring. That's what this is. It's to remind you of the royal law of liberty. Amen. It's white for purity, blue for the law. Amen. It's to remind you of where you came from. There's an old Yiddish saying, if you don't know where you came from, how do you know where you're going? It's not Jewish. Oh, did I go? What am I doing? I got it turned upside down. All right. Yahweh. Oh, you have to understand, when, 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 you, when you go to one of their camp meetings, Got to be careful. I don't want to drift into that. Now, come on, Randy. When you go to one of their camp meetings, they'll start out with God and with Jesus. But, you know, by the weekend, then they're starting to talk about Yahweh and Yeshua. And they're wanting you to be Jewish. 
Well, let me tell you something. Yahweh isn't Jewish. In Hebrew, it's called the Tetrachromaton. It is the sacred name. In most places where you see the word Lord or the Hebrew substitution for the Tetrachromaton, the substituted word in Hebrew is Adonai. Check me out. Even with the, with the very inadequate Strong's Concordance. Okay? That's cynical. Thank you, thank you, John. Sorry. The name of our Savior was not Jesus. If you'd have called him Jesus when he was here, he might or might not have recognized who you were talking to. Because his name was Yeshua. That's what his name was. No, it's not Jewish. Yeah, yes, it is. But you understand the word Jew, where it comes from? It comes from the tribe of Judah. It was the kingdom of Judah, Benjamin, Levi, and Judah, the southern kingdom. Do you understand that? So when you say Jew, that's a generic for the southern kingdom. The northern tribes were taken away by Assyria. So you need to understand your definitions, okay? And we really don't know whether it was pronounced Yahweh, because uh, it, you know, in, during the Hellenization of the world, Alexander nearly stamped out every language but Greek. He did. And so in the process, young Jewish males would mutilate their bodies so that they could participate in the Greek games. Because the Greek games were done in the nude and they could immediately be identified as Jewish. So you need to understand that the, 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 the language went through some modification. And so when a Jew would come or a Hebrew would come to that name and it would say Yahweh, or whatever the name, the Tetrachromaton, however it was pronounced, they would substitute Adonai because the name was too sacred for them to take on their lips. I think sometimes we do, that stress the sacred name, that we do take that name a little lightly. Uh, some say it's Iahua, some say it's Ove, Yove Vave. I don't know. That's not the point, but it's not Jewish. And this isn't Jewish. Leviticus 19, 27 and 28. You shall not round the corners of your heads. That's tonsure. By the way, have you seen monks? The little round circle? That's tonsure. It is a sun symbol. Neither shalt thou mar the corners of thy beard. You shall not make any cuttings in your flesh. That's piercing, folks. Or print any marks on you. I am the Lord. God said you're a different people. Do you understand there's some places you can't go that others who aren't going to heaven can go? There's some things you, can eat, you can't eat that people who aren't planning on going to heaven can eat. There are some people you can, can't hang with that people who aren't going to heaven can hang with. Do you understand that a peculiar people doesn't mean oddballs. It means separated. And they're separated because of holiness. Now, the, our friend the scholar says, all those who go to the feast are, are non-Trinitarian. That's a wide brush to paint things with. It's a wide brush. By the way, there's a lot of people that come to this camp meeting that have their own agendas. And by the way, I get a little irritated when I hear them pushing their agendas. Out, you know, attaching themselves to what John and Clara have tried to build up here and then you know, doing something underneath, whether it's Lunar Sabbath or anything else. I'm sorry, buy your own property, do your own program. Amen. Amen. <laughs> yeah. Or feast keepers all go to Lunar Sabbath. That was another statement that was made. It's a gateway. It's a gateway into the Lunar Sabbath. No, it's not. Tragically, there are feast keepers who have become involved in the Lunar Sabbath. Joshua 24, 15. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That may bring you into very straight places, brothers and sisters. It may put you at odds with your closest friends. It may put you at odds with mother and father, with son and with daughter. Do you understand that? I come not to bring peace but a sword. 
Does that mean you run into and, 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 and give people guns to shoot you with or swords to slice you with? No, no, you don't do that. But you have to stand for the truth though the heavens fall. And, and as, I've, as I've looked out, you know, we've gone through some things during the rain, haven't we? We've had, we've had tents inside of tents, under tarps, you know. And, and I think to myself, you know, I don't like being cold. My wife hates being cold. In fact, I think she was born cold. She crawls into bed and puts her feet right underneath me. And they're cold. She goes, you must love me a lot because you let me do that. Amen. I do. But, to, 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 you know, we don't have a, a, a heating blanket here. Uh, and so I crawl into bed on her side and I warm it up and then I tell her, okay, it's warm enough, you can get in now. But the truth is, there's going to come a time when we're going to be cold, wet, hungry, miserable in the very near future. And Jeremiah says, if, you've, if you have run with the footmen and they've wearied thee, how then canst thou contend with horses? And if in the land of peace wherein you trusted they wearied thee, then how wilt thou do in the swelling of Jordan? Folks, where we're going, there's not going to be dryers and washers and, and RVs and electricity. There won't be all the conveniences because God is preparing a people to go through a time of trouble such as never been on the earth. In fact, it's going to be so bad, and this is not to frighten you. It's going to be so bad that he's going to cut it short. Brothers and sisters, when I, when I preach like this, I can scare myself to death. I want to crawl into bed, go to sleep, draw, go into a fetal position and say, wake me up when it's over. Oh, but the honor that God is going to bestow upon them who are faithful. I have not seen nor ear heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man. The wonders... God has prepared for those who love Him. And that really is the question tonight. It's not feast keeping versus not feast keeping. It's not, it's truth versus error. It's, it's saying, Jesus, whatever you want, I want to be yours. And there's too little of that kind of dedication in the church today. My sister-in-law, I love her dearly. She was rooting for me all the time I was chasing her sister. Uh, but I'll tell you what, you do not want to wake that woman up out of a sound sleep. You will hear words that are not even in the dictionary. She will put you down the road because she doesn't like to be woken up. A lot of our lovely, wonderful church members are very sound asleep. And when you wake them up, they may become very, very irate. But I really believe on the other side in the kingdom we're going to see people there that we woke up that, are, that were just as angry as they could be at us. But you know something? They won't be angry over there. 2 Samuel 24, 14. I thought to myself, you know, I've done some stuff that's really, really stupid. I don't stand up here, Lily White. I've told you that before. I have acted abominably. And I'm not going to explain it to you because it's none of your business for you to know where Satan has been victorious in my life. But when I have been in that mode, I have really hurt and destroyed people. I know because some of them have, have said that. I'm sorry for that. But you know something, David, when he numbered Israel and he was confronted with it, what did he do? He said, I've sinned. God gave him some options. Look at what David chose. And David said unto Gad, I am in great strait. Let us fall now into the hand of the Lord, for his mercies are great, and let me not fall into the hand of man. If I've got to be punished, God punish me. But don't turn me over to the heathen, please. 1 Peter 4, 17 and 18. For the time has come that judges must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall, be the end, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? You know, I, I don't want anyone to go home 
thinking that somehow you're supposed to just fit in and go with the flow. No. The time for going with the flow is over. But it is never a time to be unchristlike. I want that to sink in. We need to bear our testimony. And we need to be resolute in that testimony. Amen? But it's not a time to go and getting a chainsaw and cutting the steeple off the church. That's not a way to win friends and influence people. It's not the time to go and cut down the Christmas tree at Christmas time. Bear your testimony. There's a poem, and I don't know at all, but it's a good one. It says, I'd rather see a sermon than hear one any day. I'm rather one would walk with me than merely show the way. The eye's a better pupil. The tongue too fast may run. I'd rather see a sermon. I'd rather hear a sermon, uh, see a sermon than hear one any day. I wanted to read this as I close because I found this to be very, very interesting. Oh, one other thing before I get to this. And, you know, I got 27 minutes, 40. Well, I'm not going to take it all. But I, I want you to understand something. Uh, our friend the scholar talks about how, how Passover, how, how the, uh, the, the feast days are movable. That's a big thing with him. They're movable. And, and they're movable because, you know, sometimes the lunar cycle, cycle is out of sync with the solar cycle. You know that, don't you? And after about 11 years, they had a way of inserting an extra month. It would be the second month of Adar. There was ways with which the Jewish, uh, the, the Hebrew economy had a way of getting things back in sync. Otherwise, you know, just like any other calendar, it would get out of sync so far that the seasons would be really wild. And so because of this, he says, the Sabbath was created on the seventh day of the week. Do you agree? Yes. By the way, do you agree? Okay. Yes? Okay. Now... We, he wanted to make a big, a big thing about the fact, well, you know, uh, wouldn't, it be, wouldn't it be wonderful if, if, if you weren't ready for your sermon on Sabbath? Why don't you just wait till the next day? Nuh-uh. You'd wait till the next Sabbath. Hello. If the Passover were to be moved because of, for some reason, it would be moved according to the moon. A month. Not a week, two weeks, three weeks, five days. So you see, it's a straw man. Do you understand what, I say, what I'm saying when I say it's a straw man? He puts it up there as a, a, a seeming argument that the feast days are movable, therefore they didn't come from creation. Do you understand his reasoning? And, and the Sabbath is, is, is fixed because it's the Sabbath with the, uh, with the um, what does he call it, the, the article? Definite article, the, in the front of it. And the others are Sabbath days. And then he goes to Leviticus and he goes through there and he says, the seventh day Sabbath is on one side like a bookend and the seventh day Sabbath is on the other end. And in between are all these days that are set by the moon. And, 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 and so, you know, that moves. So you don't have to worry about that. That's all gone away. That may not be his exact reasoning, but that's what I heard. As we, as we look at this, uh, and... and you have to be very careful sometimes, folks, because, you know, people don't like giving up uh, Americanism, apple pie. Yeah, you, you, do you understand what I'm saying? Satan has surrounded his heathen, heathen f festivals with so many warm fuzzies. Chestnuts roasting on an open fire. Isn't that nice and warm? Sleigh ride, jingle bells. It's nice and comfy and cozy and isn't it just sweet? We sing all these pretty carols. I'd like to spring them and sing them in the fall. I don't know why we don't. But do you understand what I'm saying? He surrounded his stuff with all sorts of warm fuzzies and made it so appealing to children. And as you get older, you just kind of go into it. But look at this. This was written from Australia. It's in, in Fundamentals of Education, page 320.3. She's pretty direct right here, by the way. The youth in this country, what country? What country? Australia. Australia. Okay, well, you've got to understand that. By the way, they are part of the British Commonwealth. At least they were. You know, they used to say that the sun never set on the British Empire. And an Irishman said that's because God doesn't touch, tr trust the English in the dark. I can say that because I'm part English. 
But the youth in this country require more earnest spiritual labor than in any other country we have yet visited. Wow. Of course, that might have something to do with the fact that Australia was part of Her Majesty's penal colony. And that's also why when you talk to somebody from New Zealand, you don't want to ask them if they're from Australia. <laughs> I mean, that's like insulting them. Okay? You just don't want to do that. Uh, because uh, Australians, when they talk, they talk very slow and drawn out. It's like a southern accent. Like the Geico lizard. Okay? We have yet visited. Temptations are strong and numerous. The many holidays and the habits of idleness are most unfavorable for the young. Satan makes the idle man a partaker and a co-worker in his schemes. And the Lord Jesus does not abide in the heart by faith. The children and the youth are not educated to realize that their influence is a power for good or for evil. It should ever be kept before them how much they can accomplish. They should be encouraged to reach the highest standard of rectitude. But from their youth... Up, they have been educated to the popular idea that the appointed holidays must be treated with respect and be observed. From the light that the Lord has given me, these days have no more influence for good than would the worship of heathen deities, for this is really nothing less. Oh, she wrote that from Australia. I wonder if that's a little after she said it was okay to bring a, a, a fir tree into the church and decorate it with money. Which came first? You see, you can, uh, unfortunately, you can oftentimes twist things to make them say what you want them to say. These days are Satan's special harvest seasons. That's interesting. What are the feast days that we celebrate based on? The harvest. What are Satan's feast days based on? His harvest. These days are Satan's special harvest seasons. The money drawn from men and women is expended for that which is not bread. The youth are educated to love those things which are demoralizing things, which the Word of God condemns. The influence is evil and only evil continually. That's pretty strong stuff, isn't it, folks? Now, I can probably get in more trouble for quoting this than anything else I've done this entire week. Because there's something about attacking Christmas that is like a, a, attacking Americanism, motherhood, and apple pie. You just don't do that. You can even go after Halloween and Easter because a lot of our Adventist brethren believe that those are pretty bad. But don't touch Christmas. A mass for Christ? And, and, and not to make a, a real big thing about this, look at this. Daniel 7.25, He shall speak great words against the Most High and shall wear off the saints of the Most High and think, read it with me, to change times and laws. And it shall be given unto him, how many? Times and a half a times. Times is a year, two times is two years, a half a time is a half a year, three and a half years, 1260 days, 42 months. It's all the same period. But by the way, prophecy repeats itself, doesn't it? Of course, that's a whole nother feast. <laughs> but as we look at these things, brothers and sisters, we don't need to attack our brothers and sisters on these issues, but we do need to educate them. And as we educate them, then we need to shut up and not nag. Let the Holy Spirit bring it forward. And we need not to participate with the stuff, okay? We turn our light out on Halloween. We don't hand out tracks because people won't read them we don't hand out little healthy treats because people won't eat them we turn our front porch light off because we don't want young people coming and saying trick-or-treat to us we do not want to in any way support the day that on the witch's calendar is the most sacred day that there is the most satanic day that there is. We don't want to participate in that. And, and, and so, you know, I'm not going to dress up like a shepherd or dress up like Abraham and go to my church and we're going to have a, have a special dress-up party where we dress up like disciples or, or Bible characters. No, I'm not going to participate in that kind of material at all. Amen. Okay? And I, I cannot, I will not, like this pastor who wants to filter everything that uh, their, his church uh, looks at or watches, I'm not going to filter 
what everybody else in my church does. But I can filter what I do. Do you hear what I just said? I can filter what I do. It's not my job to control what you do. But it's my job to tell you what the will of God is. And to do it in a kind and loving manner that is literally enthusiastic. When you get enthusiastic about something, I'll tell you what, enthusiasm is catching. We need to be enthusiastic about the right stuff. You know, Ellen White, in volume five of the testimonies, I think that's it, isn't it, Jerry? She tells a story about uh, people. They pack up wagons. They load them with everything, all their treasures, all the things that they think are important. And they start out of town. And as they start out of town, as they go further and further, the, the road begins to climb into the foothills and then, it, then the road begins to narrow and, and, the, and there's, there's cliffs on either side and the, and the cliffs begin to, to narrow and, and pretty soon the wagon can't go any further so they have to unload the wagon and now they have to sort out those things that are, are most important to them so, because there's just enough room for the horses to go. And so then, they, then they, they put those most precious things on the horses and then they begin to go further but the canyon continues to narrow and narrow and narrow and pretty soon the horses can't fit in the canyon. And so they once again have to go through all their treasures, all the things that they love and adore and they have to let go of some of those, only what they can carry and now it's not a canyon, the canyon on the left side has begun to fall away and now it's just a trail that goes along the face of the cliff and as they go further the trail's getting narrower and narrower and those of you who have, have, have done stuff with a pack, Jerry was talking about running with a 60 pound pack and, and having to fall on their... Uh, didn't you say fall forward and you always fell because there was ticks on the ground, didn't want any ticks on you? But imagine 60 pound pack. Here's all your treasures, the things you love, the things you want, the things that are most valuable to you. Now you've been leaving things that were very valuable to you all the way along, haven't you? But you have to keep your balance on this very narrow path as it gets narrower and narrower. Now pretty soon uh, you've got to get rid of the pack because it, keep, it puts you off balance. You see, you have to keep your center of balance. And so now you're, you're just walking one foot in front of another. It's getting narrower and narrower. And pretty soon you have to take your shoes off because the path is too narrow to wear shoes. And now you're in your stocking feet, but your stocking feet may slip. So you take your socks off. You're barefooted. And now you're, you're inching along. And by this time, you probably are facing the cliffside and, you're, and, and, and someone lets down a little string. And it's just enough to help you keep balance. You don't know exactly, you know, just what it'll do. But as you're going along, you're beginning to put more and more weight on that string. And you know what that string's doing? It's getting bigger. It's getting thicker. And you're putting more of your weight because you have to. The path is virtually disappearing. You've got to put in pretty soon. The, the, it's like a huge cord. And, and, and the people, you know somebody's gone in front of you because there's blood on the side of the cliff. Somebody's been across there. So you know it goes somewhere. You put your weight more and more on the cord. More and more on the cord. And finally, someone shouts out, we have hold from above. And when everything else in this world has left you, you launch out on that cord because it's the cord that has been let down and held by God himself. And you swing over. Brothers and sisters, there's nothing in this world, not family, not wife, not husband, not child, not parent, not job, not your home. Nothing is worth keeping you in a situation where you will fall off the side of the cliff or you'll stay back where your treasure is. The Bible says where a man's heart is, where his treasure is, that's where his heart is. What do you have today? I've asked Kathy to sing that song once again. There is coming a time, brothers and sisters, when this will all close up. The Bible, or the spirit of prophecy, or Bible, the Bible says. And, and, the Bible says that judgment begins where? 
fact, we had the text up there, didn't we? It begins in the house of the Lord. And it means it's going to close for God's people before it closes for the rest of the world. What that means is you and I need to be determined now that we are going through with Jesus Christ so that the seal can be placed upon us. Yeah, the coward's way out is to say, Lord, you can, <laughs> I'm like David, kill me, you let me die, I'm fine. But I'd rather fall into your arms, into the arms of the enemy. Because trust me, Satan wants to devastate you. Soon, it will be too late. Oh. 
This is not scare tactics. Folks, in fact, to those who may be plants, you may have sold your soul. I want you to know that he can make that which was dead as though it were alive. I've read the back of the book, and I win. And you can win too. No matter who you've sworn allegiance to, no matter who you have decided that you will serve, right now you can change and you can become alive to him. I believe that. I believe the gospel can convert anyone, including, can I say it, a Jesuit? God loves you with an everlasting love. And I believe tonight that there will be a huge hole in the heart of our God over that covering cherub that once turned and walked away from him. He will weep for that fallen angel. He does not hate Satan. He doesn't hate the devil. He hates what sin does to his creation. Because sin at its very basis destroys his creation. That's what he hates. And I would challenge everybody here as we leave. Look, live, and walk. Put one foot in front of another. And do what he's asked you to do. Let's pray. Oh, Abba Father, my Savior, my Lord, I have no idea why you have asked me to do anything. I am the meanest of all your subjects, certainly unworthy, but Lord, if this faulty lump of clay can be fashioned into into a vessel fit for a king, then anybody in this room can be fashioned into the same instrument. Lord, I pray for that for everyone. I pray that for everyone that's listening. It's not too late. If it was too late, this message would not be being beamed forward. But soon it will be too late. Tonight, may we make a covenant with you, a covenant through sacrifice to give up all those things that would take us and keep us away from you. And I pray this in the precious name of Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, and all God's people said,